Hello, welcome everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And we're just getting ready to start our panel. If you just want to take your seats if you haven't already. And if there's any seats left in the front, I invite you guys to like come closer, please, a little bit closer. I know we have mics, but hopefully you don't have to yell too much or anything to reach your ears. Just make it as close and intimate as possible. Yes, I'm looking at you folks in the back. You want to come closer? No? Yes, maybe. Maybe we'll, we'll see if you guys warm up to us. I promise we don't have COVID-19. Uh -huh. And you can, <laughs> you can come closer. <laughs> um, yeah, no coronavirus around here. Hmm? All right. So we're just going to be starting in a few minutes, just a minute or so. We're just going to make sure all of our tech is running. We have a live stream tonight. If, um, if you guys know anyone that couldn't be here and you want to share the live stream, it is Afrocentric TV on YouTube. Afrocentric, so that is A-F-R-I, not A-F-R-O. So you can share that and uh, let people know they can watch along with us. Okay, we're ready. Awesome, thank you. So hello everyone again, my name is Nzinga Miller. I don't know if you all know me, if you see my face a few times at the front of this room, um, but I'll be your host today and I'm gonna be moderating with our panelists. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about this thought-provoking discussion that we have. And we're all here because we are here to talk about our Afrocentric um, immersion program aspirations. What would that look like in our communities? And uh, we have some of the experts right here with us. We're really happy to have a panel f of all women. Happy International <laughs> Women's Month. <laughs> right, very reflective of what um, a lot of our first educators uh, look like in our lives, uh, the women in our lives. And so uh, before we go into our panel, I am going to be asking Dr. Harvey Miller, who is the co-chair of ALI, to say a few words of welcome and introduction. And uh, just a little bit about Dr. Miller. He is a full professor in the Faculty of Management Science at St. Mary's University. He's originally from St. Lucia, 
and he's been living in Halifax since 1982. So does that make him Scotian yet? Are we, are we voting yes? Okay, all right, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> so he came to study at the Technical University of Nova Scotia, now the Dalhousie Faculty of Engineering. And Dr. Miller received his Bachelor's of Engineering at the University of West Indies in Trinidad, his Master of Science and PhD in Industrial Engineering from, again, what is, I think that's here twice, what is the Dalhousie School of Engineering. Most people know Harvey as a passionate promoter of Afrocentric education and an ECMA and ANZMA award-winning jazz guitar player. I don't know, did I, I didn't know all of that. Just joking. Yes, so um, we are going to ask Dr. Miller to give us a word, and if we, actually a reminder, if we could all have our phones on silent, not to pick, not to pick on anybody, but <laughs> we will be getting started, and we just want to make sure that the live stream doesn't get interrupted. There you go. No problem. Uh, good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Hotep? Uh, I think before I start, uh, we should ask Crystal to come and do the normal thing about um, fire drills and all that kind of stuff, right? So Crystal? We're going to ask Crystal to do that first, uh, and then I will just say a couple of words. Crystal Muller is um, uh, one of the original members of the Afrocentric, uh, sorry, of the African Canadian Education Project, which was uh, founded back in 1989, a precursor to a lot of the work that we're doing right now. And uh, she's also a member of the Afrocentric Learning Institute. So, Crystal Muller. But tonight I'm wearing the hat of uh, Halifax Public Libraries. <laughs> uh, a couple things. Number one, as Nzinga already mentioned, phones on vibrate or silent so that we don't disturb the program. Number two, out the back door, turn to your left or right, and down the left hand side, left -hand side of the hallway, there are three public washrooms. So that's where your washrooms are located. Um, other than that, uh, well just uh, Halifax Public Libraries has a no violence policy, so keep it clean. <laughs> and we will uh, commence with this evening's program. Hope you all have a good time. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, Crystal. So uh, let me start off by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Mi Mi'kma'ki and uh, that we stand in uh, solidarity with them at the struggle for freedom and liberation. I also want to say that um, we also stand on the shoulders of our ancestors who were brought here against their will for more than 300 or 400 years, correct? And that um, it is that their struggle that we benefited from that allow us to be standing here today. I think for the moment has a sense that we're still standing. So we're still standing because we stand on their shoulders as well. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the ancestors in that regard and all those who have struggled to create a better life for us. So uh, what has brought us here uh, today with this uh, very exciting uh, panel discussion that we're about to engage in, and it's not supposed to be a situation where the panel tell you all of the ideas. They want to get some feedback from you on your ideas as well because it is a topic that we think uh, is deserving of discussion and debate. And so, you know, there's been lots of studies um, that have been sh that has shown that African Nova Scotian learners are supposedly, and I put that in quotes, underperforming when it comes to the general uh, student population. And that um, the struggle for educational equity has been ongoing ever since we got to this place. Right? The, all the um, work that were done by many of the, of, of, of uh, of the trailblazers before in terms of trying to get educational equity um, is still ongoing. Um, when we think about the current system that we are inheriting, uh, there's been uh, some in initiatives that have been undertaken uh, to attempt to address what is perceived as the performance gap. However, it appears that that gap is not closing as fast as it should. In some cases, it still appears to be widening. And it begs the question, why? Why is it so difficult to close this particular gap? We have a lot of great solutions. We, you know, we, we have uh, uh, programs like uh, the Transition Year Program, the IBM M Law Program. We hear about uh, particular initiatives, the African Canadian Studies Literature Program, uh, courses, and so on. But yet still, 
we still have a long way to go, and why is that? So I think it begs the question whether the particular interventions that have been undertaken are adequate. Whether or not we need something else. Whether or not that we have fully understood the problem or the challenge, and then we've actually been able to identify the right kinds of solutions. The Afrocentric Learning Institute, which um, uh, basically the idea was germinated way back uh, when Malefi Asante came to Halifax back in 1992 um, and seeded the concept of an Afrocentric Learning Institute to, to sort of uh, take on the mantle of getting Afrocentric work done in the province. The Afrocentric Learning Institute is committed to the idea of promoting Afrocentricity as a philosophy for solving and empowering African people in the diaspora and addressing some of the uh, inequities that we face. So as part of being a thought leader, we have decided to examine potential options that can be used in the education system to address the gap. One of these ideas that we've recently began to explore is the notion of Afrocentric emotion. And so beyond just the sort of the course here and there, we feel that we need to actually elevate the initiatives at a programmatic level. And so tonight we want to discuss what Afrocentric emotion is, how would that look in the various levels of the school system, and whether or not it can deliver the promise that we wanted to deliver. So on that note, I will turn it over to our moderator. I want to thank all of you who um, who came out tonight. So give yourself a round of applause for coming out. And we have a beautiful day today too, don't we? I mean, yes, um, thank you. We have a beautiful day, uh, we have a beautiful day today because uh, as you know, we were snowed out back on February 15th. And then I want to also thank um, the, um, the uh, TD, TD Bank for being one of our sponsors uh, of this event. So let's head for TD. I'd also like to thank the, um, the sort of library system, Halifax library system. And so they are facilitating, of, or at least providing the venue. And of course, they're a partner in African Heritage Month. So we want to say a uh, special thanks to the library as well. We, we also um, want to acknowledge all the people behind the scenes that have done a fair amount of work to do this together, to put this together. So all the ALI members, um, uh, some of them are sitting here, all of them are actually sitting there, plus Crystal, myself, Sherry, Bernard, and um, I, think, I hope I didn't forget anybody else, but uh, certainly we want to thank all those folks who have put in quite a bit of work behind the scenes to make this happen, all right? So thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Miller, <laughs> for that uh, background, a, a little bit about how Afrocentricity has grown here in Nova Scotia, and the fact that those seeds have been planted a long time ago, and now they're, we're watering them, essentially. We have a lot of different initiatives that have grown. Um, you know, at the Dalhousie University, I know Barb will be talking a little bit about that. Um, in, our, in our community, we have different initiatives and centers that have grown out of the idea of Afrocentricity. But now we're here to go deeper, and we're here to, to talk about exactly how that can be rolled out in a program that benefits our kids. So I just want to give a few more small housekeeping items, which is that if there are members of media here, I'm not sure if there are, um, but please present yourself and identify yourself to me, and I will get your information. We do have spokespersons for our ALI that we would like to speak to media, so um, all Folks that do speak to media, that's their, um, they're representing their own opinions. And if you want an official comment of, from ALI, please see me so I can direct you to the right person. I also ask if you're taking photo or video just to ask permission from those in the, um, in the photo or in the scope of your photo that you can take that photo. Um, as well, again, just keep in mind that we're live streaming and just be mindful not to walk in front of the camera before we get started. And our end time tonight, we're going to try to keep everything on schedule. <laughs> you know how we can get. And our end time tonight is uh, slated for 8.30. So we're going to try to move through the questions. And I'm going to ask the panelists if they can keep their um, presentations succinct 
so that we can open up the floor to discussion and really uh, start to mine some of those ideas that um, you all came here to, to share. So thank you once again for being here. I'm gonna take a seat. I think I have someone else's mic, or is that yours? <laughs> Let me get comfortable, okay. <laughs> too official, like this has been too official. Um, so yeah, we wanna have a, a conversation first and foremost. And I wanna introduce you to who these um, amazing powerhouse women are that I'm happy to uh, be sitting next to. And so um, first, I'm just gonna go in the direction this way, but I, I'm only gonna give a brief introduction and I'll let you guys uh, speak a little bit more about who you are. So I want to introduce Delvina Bernard. Delvina Bernard is an educator and an institutional change consultant. And she is a principal founding member of ALI and former executive director of CASE, the Council on African Canadian Education. She's also an award-winning award singer, songwriter, and currently a full-time PhD student at St. Mary's University doing research in the area of reparations and development. So thank you, Delvina, for being here. I'm glad to be here. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> How's everybody feeling, by the way? Are we all awake? I know it's been a long week. Yeah? yeah? Okay, <laughs> good. I'm gonna try to like keep it upbeat. All right. And, and I know you guys were saying, oh, we're too far away from each other, so we'll just try to keep eye contact. Because we want to show off the new band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the uh, lovely Miss Karen Hudson, you know, you've seen her face uh, in so many places of influence. She is an Afrocentric educator and the principal at Auburn Drive High School and she was involved in piloting the first ever math, Afrocentric math cohort at Auburn Drive High School. And I'm gonna also introduce her as the co-chair of ALI. And so thank you for being with us. Thank you, Nazinga. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Barb Hamilton Hinch is also an Afrocentric educator. She is a professor in the School of Health and Human Performance at Dalhousie University. She is the, one of the founders of Imhotep's Legacy Academy, which is an Afrocentric um, program around STEM education that is now housed at Dalhousie. And she's also a, the co-chair of plans promoting leadership um, in health for African Nova Scotians. And yes, we're happy to have her. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Wendy Portress is a, Long, I just learned this about Wendy, has been teaching in the public school education system for 12 years or more. And she is um, an elementary school educator as well as an artist. And I would even say through her art has um, been an advocate for the community. 19 years, not 12 years. Oh my goodness, 19 years. So this, is, this just goes to show you the wealth of knowledge that we have um, in front of us. And I'm excited to Yes, so um, bring Wendy to, to us, thank you. If you see Delvina giving me um, notes, make sure to stop her. <laughs> I'm trying to keep my thoughts, my thought process going. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get to talk with you when I, when I pass the mic to you. <laughs> I wasn't giving her notes, I was, asking for I was just asking for answers to my questions. <laughs> trying to cheat on the test. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so thank you. And uh, we also want to mention that Wendy graduated from the master's cohort at Mount St. Vincent University, and that is the uh, master's cohort in lifelong learning, or the master's program in lifelong learning with a focus on Afrocentric leadership. And that was uh, designed and um, uh, in partnership with CASE and the ALI, yes. And Learning Institute. So this, these are some of the things that have happened already, and have we've been able to see lots of um, you know new people enter the workforce with that masters. So these are all great things that have come out of Afrocentric initiatives. Again, we're here because there still seems to be a gap we need to close. So I'm going to start off with you, Davina. Just give us uh, about five minutes about how you see this issue and um, what we need to know. Thank you, Nzinga. So I actually um, got my little wires crossed and thought that I was, uh, uh, oh sorry, prepared sort of like a, like a mini, like a little paper almost. Uh, but uh, my 10 minutes has been gone to five, so I'm just gonna keep talking until I'm told to stop. Uh, and you know, and I looked at this map, I thought I was having my own TED talk. 
right? And, and so, but it's, I guess it's my own mini ed talk. So um, I'm gonna talk, kind of read this like a paper with great apology, but it's kind of the best way to sort of get these ideas out that hopefully we can expand upon. And I won't get them all done, but I hope I can get to the main one, okay? So I'm just gonna start off by saying I want to address the case for Afrocentric immersion with a, from a kind of a theoretical perspective. And what, I might, what, what can I mean by this is that I'm not gonna really address the operational questions, like the questions of how such an initiative would work on the day to day or what resources it would require, because that's like a whole study in itself, or speculate on when such an initiative could actually come into being. I don't want to talk about those things. So I'm staying away from sort of like the bricks and mortar kind of issues, because those things can happen after we figure out and answer the more fundamental question of why black students need Afrocentric immersion in the first place, and who is best positioned to make this happen. Would you hold these papers as I pass them off? <laughs> Thank you. So I'm gonna focus my presentation on three sort of key points, but I'll probably only get to two of them. One is why this issue is worth exploring. And as again, I say, who are the legitimate stakeholders that ought to lead the exploration and discussion of this very important public policy debate within the African Nova Scotian education sector? And lastly, I also want to introduce a few theoretical constructs that we need to consider as we approach this issue. And I'm gonna just introduce these hopefully, but I might not get that far, uh, in the hope that others can maybe build upon these during the open discussion. So I wanna start off with definitions here. So, let me attempt a definition of the term Afrocentric immersion. So of course, I've uh, borrowed from the rationale and the frameworks of French immersion in public schools across this country. And that makes perfect sense, really, guys, because um, when you consider that, according to a study by the Canadian Parents for French, uh, which was quite some time ago, this particular study was ever since 1996, um, it was kind of determined that Kansas French immersion programs were attracting positive attention from many countries around the globe and some countries in Europe and even uh, communities in the United States have been offering immersion programs patterned on the Canadian model. So Canadian French immersion programs are a good model for us to examine as we set out to consider Afrocentric immersion because they've kind of been really, um, lauded worldwide as having done some very innovative things that we could possibly borrow from. And that same report also noted that the high level of French proficiency developed through the Canadian programs uh, comes at no cost to students' achievement in other academic aspects or subjects or areas or personal development. And I only point this out because I think one of the most common arguments against all immersion programs of any type is that students gain a high proficiency in a particular language or subject matter or cultural knowledge or focus area, but that this intense immersion in one area somehow comes at the expense of the three R's. This is one of the things that people constantly critique it about, and um, that the three R's, and but that view honestly is simply unsubstantiated from any research that I've been able to look at. And there is no real evidence to support this. And it simply is a myth that uh, for the most part has been refuted as far as I'm concerned. But it, it's gonna come up as we continue this debate. Oh, you get concentrated in one area and it's gonna impact, you know, are they developing in other areas? So I thought I'd mention it here now because I think it's gonna come up later on. Um, okay, so let me share uh, a standard definition of French immersion as a benchmark for a proposed definition of Afrocentric immersion. And in fact, I'm gonna use the definition provided by the Nova Scotia Department of Education. So French immersion is defined in this way from everything I could find online and read about and what I've known from working in the Department of Education 
for 19 years, regional centers for education in Nova Scotia offer French immersion programs. It's a program offered to students in Anglophone schools who wish to develop a greater degree of competence, so greater degree of competence, because it's, so it's very concentrated in French. The immersion program is an alternative approach, and I em emphasize that as well, to learning French, within a structure that provides greater intensity for learning and teaching and focuses on literacy through the various disciplines taught. Now, Nova Scotia has two entry points into French immersion. Most people probably know that they have early French immersion, which begins in grade prime and goes to 12, and then they have the late immersion, which begins in grade seven and then goes to grade 12. And courses taught from grade seven to nine, which is the late immersion, and it's the reason why I'm gonna mention this, because I, you'll see why, um, include social studies, language arts, of course, French language arts, science and health, healthy living, and the content of these subjects sometimes uh, in French mirrors that offered in the English stream, okay? So, to help me round out my benchmark, or our benchmark, because everything you do these days when you come with new programs, they want research-based, you know, sort of uh, recommendations, is the fact that I also borrow from the mandate of the Francophone School Board, CSAP, and that's because they have a legislative mandate that goes beyond language rights. It goes beyond language rights. Because section 16 of the Education Act gives the Francophone School Board additional responsibilities, which includes promotion of Acadian culture. All right? Promotion of Acadian culture. Listen up, because you know that's right in line with what we're trying to talk about. Um, as well as the French language itself. So with this in mind as a benchmark, here is the proposed working definition of Afrocentric immersion, which aims to help students in our community who also want a greater degree of competence, but in Afrocentric knowledge. And like French immersion, this definition incorporates an alternative approach to learning, and also within a structure that provides greater intensity, and finally, Drawing upon the Francophone School Board, our definition, or this definition, includes promotion of African Nova Scotian culture. So that's kind of like my uh, theoretical construct there. And then, drum roll please for the definition. One more minute. <laughs> for the <laughs> definition. So the definition that I'm sort of positing here as a first attempt to <laughs> say this kind of thing, which hopefully collectively we will expand and interrogate this definition to come up with something that is really born out of public policy among black people. So I have here, Afrocentric immersion is a public school program of education for African Nova Scotian learners that offers an alternative approach to meeting learning outcomes within a structure that promotes academic excellence as I'm sorry, promotes academic access as well as opportunities for the development and preservation of Afrocentric cultural competencies. So now, that's just a short version, that some key goals of Afrocentric immersion would be to center African Nova Scotian learners in their own social and cultural references in the teaching and learning exchange. A second will be to promote African-centered cultural values through the principles of Nguza Saba. And I say that and choose that because I think that most people are very familiar with the principles of Nguza Saba, which are the seven principles of Kwanzaa. And it's already taught in our schools and it, it really does encompass a whole way of life. Because when you think of like the totality of an individual, the, the principles of unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith, so that if these are some of the key goals of Afrocentric immersion, these would definitely be very instructive in terms of what we want to do. Um, it also is, uh, the other goal is to be a cultural, an Afrocentric immersion program could be a cultural knowledge hub dedicated to empowering African Nova Scotian learners to overcome the historical legacy of enslavement and anti-black racism which has been a primary barrier to African Nova Scotian 
educational justice. Mm -hmm. So that is the totality of mm -hmm. what I would put out for Thank you. for that. And then I'll just do one little last thing <laughs> in Zynga, is that some key principles would be that Afrocentric immersion provide an African worldview, and by this I mean an approach that places African people at the center as subjects and not objects on the margins of Eurocentric realities in respect to so an Afrocentric perspective or worldview around curriculum content, around desired learning outcomes, around teaching methods, around student evaluation, instructional personnel, instructional resources, and parent and community engagement. Mm -hmm. And very much like, as I close, like the I'm thinking around late immersion kind of a program. Mm -hmm. When I mention the subjects that they have in the French immersion for late immersion, similarly, and sort of an ideal kind of situation, or, or, or a possible, I should say, or potential, might be courses such as African heritage literature, which we already have developed this in, and have been doing in our schools for years. African-Canadian social studies, where we already have that in our schools already. Afrocentric mathematics, well, we have the expert sitting here to my left who uh, created uh, and is piloting the very first Afrocentric math cohort. We have institutions like Imhotep, who have been doing STEM for quite some time, who could certainly put together an Afrocentric science component for us. And because our students has been discussed more and more, don't need just STEM, we need STEAM. So yeah, we, need the, thank you. we need the mm -hmm. science, technology, exactly. engineering, arts, and math, because exactly. we love that. Mm -hmm. There could be a course in Afrocentric performing arts that would expose our kids to exactly. music, dance, you know, fine art, theater. Mm -hmm. And one of the courses that I like that they have on the French immersion, late immersion, is they have healthy living. Wouldn't it be great if we had a course mm -hmm. in healthy living from the perspective of African Canadian reality experience. That's where they can discuss those issues. Mm -hmm. Like what does it mean to be healthy? What does it mean to be m emotionally healthy, mentally healthy when you're dealing with racism and all these kinds of things, anger management, all these things that probation officers are looking at our kids for that they don't need to have if they could get the right things in school. So right. those are my mm -hmm. um, contributions. We'll have some time to and dig I deeper a, into yeah, that. Yeah, and I yeah. have another. <laughs> and for anybody who wants to meet me outside, I have another whole <laughs> half of a paper. <laughs> 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 and I'll bring the Ed Talk mat. And I can have my own little Ed Talk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thanks for laying that groundwork. Um, I. I know that some of the questions that we have here will be able to get, you know, go deeper into um, what that framework looks like from a philosophy, but also from a, a little bit of a practical standpoint. And I will have some challenging questions to, to test you guys, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to pass it over to Karen. Yes. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to ask if, um, if you would like me to help keep, keep time or if you're if you're good for that. Um, yeah. I'm going to try to stay on time. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a book, but I do have some um, information. I just want to talk about the Afrocentric cohort. Mm -hmm. And I want to start with uh, a few quotes. And just briefly, I feel smart. I feel capable. I feel normal. I feel like I belong. I am black. This is how some of our students are feeling today. As an Afrocentric uh, program that we decide to do at Auburn Drive High School, it is dedicated and committed to academics and developing social skills amongst our students. What we try to do is to center our students in their history, in their culture. It's rooted in who they are. So who they are in terms of their self-image, um, self-identity, uh, self-actualization, self-awareness, self-discipline, all those self. We're trying to center our children in their own philosophy and education. And with that, we're also trying to debunk the myth 
that our children can do math. That's what it's centered in. So we're trying to make sure that our children are encouraged and learn that they have a strong culture capital, that they have a strong culture knowledge, that they have a strong culture currency, and that they can examine math every day, that they just don't know that they're doing it, but they are, because we do skills in terms of ordering, classifying, counting, measuring, multiplications. We do that every day. We just don't think about it. And so the reason why we decided to do the Afrocentric cohort is because we're trying to erase some of those myths and destroy some of those boundaries and address some of those um, gaps that Devine alluded to earlier, those opportunity gaps, those educational gaps, those achievement gaps that do exist. The other thing that does exist within our school system is that um, there's an omission that um, black people have not accomplished or achieved any greatness. So we want to make sure that our students feel that they are part of a legacy, that they can create their own stories, create their own narratives. So that's one of the things that we try to do is that the students feel that they're capable. It's focused on academic excellence, like Vina said. We try to um, deal with issues in terms of collectivism, because our children work from a sense of communal. They're not in terms of, they can do independent work and individualism, but they strive. They strive when they work together. And when you see them, they become their own leaders within their own work, and they create their own stories. It also looks at the experience of students from a positive way, so we look from assets. We try to look away from deficits. We know that math is hard work. We're very realistic. Math is hard. It's rigor work, but it takes support. It takes time. It takes commitment. And so we challenge them to do that. We challenge them, you've got to be committed to this. It's not going to come easy, but if you want it, you've got it. And we're there for you for support as well. So we challenge their intellectual achievement, their responsibility, their attitudes, and at the same time, we're trying to build up their self-confidence and their self-esteem. So for me, I'm passionate about it because I love our, our black children. I love all children, but I love our children, and I want to see them do well, and I know they can do well. So I try to push them, sometimes a lot, but that's what they want. They want the same type of expectation that everybody else has. They want us to say that, you know what, don't perceive me as this, perceive me as that. And if we look at the way our perceptions are for the expectations for our children, we will see that we will actually change some of that value. We want them also to create a sense of ownership and a sense of belonging and to be grounded in their own social reality. I'm not going to go too much longer because I want to keep to my five minutes. But um, you have 45 purpose, seconds. Five seconds? Okay. 45. Oh, 45? Okay. Yeah, you're doing pretty good. The other thing that we're trying to do is that we try to create a space for them. So we create the cohort because it's their space. It's their time to come together and work. Because, you know, within our school system, remember we were left with the curriculum. We're sometimes seen as being marginalized. We're trying to make sure that we're centered. So how do we center our children? By creating a space, the Afrocentric cohort. Dr. Malefi talks about centering ourselves, rooted in our history, rooted in our richness of African people. That's what we do at um, Auburn Drive High School. 